As sports history fans, we often reminisce about the legends. Willis Reed limping on to the NBA Finals Court, Kurt Schilling's bloody stock, Kerry Strong's courageous dismount, and so many more. These moments often define sports history. But what about the countless injuries that did not become legends or careers that were derailed due to inadequate care? That's where this episode sponsor comes in. Introducing to you, ILP Sports Consultants, your trusted sports injury partner, available 24-7. Brian Maelli at ILP Sports Consultants has over 20 years of experience in the orthopedic and sports medicine industry, and he has worked with athletes across the gamut, from youth to amateurs, professionals, in almost every sport played in the United States of America, accommodating athletes at every stage of their career. This adaptability ensures that ILP services are perfectly tailored to your skill level, no matter where you are in your athletic journey. With ILP, you are in control. Choose the steps that matter most to you. Diagnosis, treatment plan, recovery, or the whole journey. ILP services are tailored to your unique needs. Rushing for care is a common pitfall leading to future problems. ILP Sports Consultants helps you make the right decisions, ensuring that you receive timely and safe care. And here's the bonus. Brian hosts the Injured List podcast, sharing insights and athlete stories you won't want to miss. Whether you're a concerned parent or grandparent, or an athlete yourself seeking guidance, ILP Sports Consultants is your beacon of hope in sports injury management. Visit ILPSports.com today. That's the letters ILP. Sports.com. ILP Sports Consultants, where your well-being is the priority and your recovery is the mission. Choose ILP Sports Consultants for a healthier sports journey, helping you get back in the game the smart way. Blog Talk Radio. final score that would bring victory after 60 minutes of battle on the gridiron. Tonight, we'll explore the world of gridiron greats. Welcome to Gridiron Greats Football History and its memorabilia on the Gridiron Greats Publishing and Broadcasting Network. And we're live from the Southport, North Carolina, home of Gridiron Greats Magazine. I'm Bob Swick, publisher and editor of Gridiron Greats Magazine. I'll be your host for the show. Gridiron Greats is the only publication in America that focuses upon the history and memorabilia of the North American football game since its inception in 1869. We'll cover 150 plus years of football history and memorabilia. You can find us on the web at gridirongreatsmagazine.com. It is at this time I'd like to introduce my co-host, who's a senior contributing writer to Gridiron Greats Magazine, a football memorabilia historian. Specializing in pre-World War II items, in particular Red Grange, and I also see I don't see Hawk items, in particular Steve Larkin. He hails from Portland, Oregon. Mr. Joe Squires, Joe, welcome to the show this evening. Ah, uh, Captain, so good to be back, sir. So good to be back. Very, very excited for today's show. Happy New Year, Joe. We're back for an all-new season of shows for 2022. And we're going to lead off tonight's show with an incredible purchase that occurred in the market 
of cards over the past Absolutely. few weeks. The tops is being sold to fanatics. And for people who have been following this, collectors who have been following it, fanatics received the NFL license uh-huh. for all sorts of uh, fan wear, cards, et cetera, et cetera. And uh-huh. uh, I, I'm just in a little state of shock that Top yeah. was sold to Fanatics. Your thoughts? I'm going to hand off to you. Now, uh, the end of an era, Captain, for sure. Uh, had had you heard of Fanatics before this? Well, I've, I've heard bits and pieces of, about them, and I, I, I need to understand Ditto, yeah. them to be more of a, um, a, a um, fan type clothing, Good things point. of that nature type of vendor yep. rather than an actual uh, memorabilia slash card manufacturer. So, so yep. it doesn't, you know, again, the licenses that went to Fanatics, which are basically all of them, um, mm-hmm. really has changed the whole marketplace to a very, very yep. large degree. And again, uh, as a recap, 2015 was the last year Top had their license to produce football cards. And beginning in 2016, Panini owned the exclusive rights, which they continue to own through uh, apparently another two seasons from what, I, what I'm understanding. And um, then I don't know what's going to happen to Panini other than maybe they're going to be bought by Fanatics at the same time. But you only had for football cards uh, for the past six seasons one producer uh, which produced a bunch of old names of cards for Donruss to be a few playoff. Um, And now now they're... going to be owned by TAP. So I'm wondering, and a lot of people have wondered at the same time, and we've talked about this briefly before, does this mean now that um, TAP's football cards are going to be back? Are they going to be called yeah. TAP Fanatics? Or, or, I have yeah. no clue. No idea. Yeah. And, no idea. Yeah, and I agree with you. I'd heard of Fanatics as, you know, as clothing, as hats, as band, you know, stuff like that, exactly like you said. Um, but not, you know, and it, you know, in sports world, but here they are. Uh, so, I mean, you know, in preparation for this, I mean, I, you know, when I first heard, heard about this, I Googled fanatics. I'm like, oh, well, that's kind of interesting. I wonder if their background is just, and the first thing that's up, their, their, you know, you know, their mantra, their, their tagline is fanatics official, officially licenses everything. And I was like, well, that's, that's pretty boisterous. I like that. Um, and if you look on their website, it's all the NCAA Division One. It's all NFL. It's all MLB and NBA, NHL. They even have MLS soccer on here. Uh, I mean, it is everything. They've got the Georgia Bulldog, you know, uh, you know, NCAA hat and football for sale. Everything. Uh, so. Perhaps, oh my gosh, I just saw a NASCAR tab on here. What the hell? Uh, but, I mean, you know, they're they're taking it over. Uh, and they have announced that they will keep it under the Topps name. There's no reason to rebrand Topps just to, to right. own it right. and to fold, fold it in under their licensing agreement. Because um, at, at first, also when I heard this, I was thought of, you know, like, you, you know, take 1979, 1980 Topps football where they didn't have license agreements, so they would take the photos and then airbrush out the logos. Um, right. And right. You know, I, I, I still, you know, have, you know, thoughts of my 1980 Steve Largent, you know, card with, you know, the, the airbrush out of the side of the helmet, and thinking that was like, like taking a practice or something, you know, when they wore blank helmets. You know, I had no idea as a 10-year-old kid why there was no Seahawk logo on the side of his helmet. You know, you don't really get in there exactly. complicated things like license. So my, at first blush, well, I was I, like, well, maybe, maybe somebody else will continue on, you know, without logos, without branding. But, I mean, I would imagine that would get halted. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's for them to take over all the sports that they're taking over is, number one, in my opinion, a Herculean task. And number two, yeah. is, it, is it just going to be every sport 
has a series of of uh, clothing, hats, blah blah blah, that are just going to be changed with the team name on it, and that's it. You know, I can see that happening down yeah. the road. Um, so uh, again, uh, is this good or bad for the hobby? I I really don't know. I mean, I. I mean, I'm hoping it'll be okay for the hobby, but at the same time, I'm saying to myself, you got a monopoly basically occurring yeah, for yeah. each sport, each sport for their memorabilia and their card, more so their cards than the memorabilia. And this is going to dramatically impact the hobby in the future. So, again, it's going to be anybody's guess to see which way they're going to go, and it's well, going to be anybody's guess to see if it's good or bad for the hobby. And again, you know, well, we've, we've gone through a pretty. Go ahead, yeah. go ahead, Joe. Oh no, I was just we, we've ask, been. I mean, will there be others? Just like you said, will Panini be making stuff? I mean, did you know? Did Fanatics go hoggers on this? Are the only football, baseball, basketball cards we're going to see from here on out going to be tops under the Fanatics label and licensing? It's going to be okay. anybody's guess. Anybody's guess to see what's going on. I've been trying to get information on it. I've talked to a few uh, few people connected, uh, slightly still with tops, and they basically do not know what's going on. And they also said, too, at the same time, uh, tops is in pretty much a state of upheaval. And if they didn't have yep. baseball beginning 2016, they were in very um, questionable conditions, mm-hmm. to say the least. Because yeah. again, baseball's well, I mean, still their bright. Right? Yeah, without licensing, you know, you're, you're with not it, much. I mean, it's worth a lot. I mean, the brand, the Topps brand, has been around. I mean, forever. I mean, right. you know, Fifty One Topps Magic is the first one I can think of. You know, and then obviously moving on from there, it's. But Fanatics paid five hundred million for Topps. That includes equipment. I mean, you've got printing, you know, presses. You've got factories with, you know, all of that. I mean. There's obviously an asset purchase. That's worth something. You know, Fanatic right. paid a buttload, you know, for the licensing rights. I mean, I, I don't uh, – let's look that up. I actually didn't look that up. Fanatic's licensing uh, agreement. Do you know what the, that is off the top of your head? Yeah, I do, that I don't know, but it's – you know, it's got to be in hundreds of millions of dollars. So, I, you know, you're, yeah. you're looking at a phenomenal – Phenomenal, probably a, a a purchase that probably ran anywhere from I don't know seven hundred million to a billion. I mean, who knows? And uh, that's a lot here's, of money to invest all at once. And are you really going to get a return? You know. Yep. And here's the number uh, per Major League. You know, per their report, they paid twenty point four million in twenty twenty for the licensing fee, the largest sum ever paid. Okay. Roughly up about two million from what they paid nineteen, and they and this gives Fanatics exclusive licensing in the baseball, you know, in in, in baseball baseball card. Uh, right. And Panini Tops will expire in twenty twenty two, which means now that they bought Tops, you know, you know that that basically would have BK'd them. So now all of a sudden you'll see Tops, you know, vertically integrating the licensing agreement that Fanatics got. I, I kind of like that it's a two for one i mean do we know who owned tops prior to fanatics buying them i mean not really i mean it could have been a you know some sort of investment banker you know you know bank you know for all we know i mean who knows so at least at least we get to see the continuation of tops products into the future with licensing uh right and uh off we go so i mean you know who knows this might be a you know you know, you know, conciliatory for the for the hobby. Where instead of seeing all this, you know, Panini and Tops putting out shiny garbage, you know, now we just get to see Tops and maybe maybe a little more quality stuff. I mean, I, I look forward to it. I just recently, last couple yeah. of years, buying more more unopened wax just out of curiosity. So it's kind of fun. You could be sitting on the next Tom Brady. Working. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and the other thing, yeah, well, well, the, well, 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 the other thing a lot of people have said to me, and we've talked about this before too. Twenty fifteen, top started 
stopped printing football cards, that was the last year people were collecting, and that's it. Yeah. A lot of people like myself, I, I really, you know, I bought a few packs here and there from 2016 to 2021, and I I'm really haven't been overly impressed with anything, and I do miss packs, to say the least. And then I find out the uh, Packer police sets from uh, stopped in 2019. They haven't issued any since then. Oh, yeah. So they were, they were basically one of the longest runs of uh, teams of police sets from police their sets, first yeah. issue in 1983, and they ran it up to 2019. So it's, it's an amazing, amazing uh, run for, for, pack, for the Packers and for those police sets at the same time. So it's, huh. it's amazing, it's really amazing. Well, you can, you can there, argue... There it is. Like like we said, uh, you know, tops. Uh, the the article says fanatics deal. You know, when fanatics got the license agreement, it says uh, fanatics deal is a blow to tops, which first produced baseball and football cards in 1951. So I wasn't I wasn't sure if there was some esoteric set before 1951, but it seems like that was the first. Uh, but I mean, well, you still boy, got the, oh you got the fault back. You got the fault backs in 1950, and then you got the uh, the uh, magic photos. In forty eight and forty nine, so you know those were the the yeah. basically the, the prelude to uh, the fifty one fifty one magic, and then you got to jump over to, to the fifty five all American, uh, yeah, which point. basically put put out of business with football. Yeah, yeah. but I don't know. When I but, read this, fanatics going hoggers on all the licensing, I, I I called it a sweep the knee moment, you know, from Karate Kid, where I'm like, geez, that is. That just gobbling all that up is literally going to take out a lot of a lot of people or a lot of other companies. And look at it, it forced tops to the table uh, and tops to sell for five hundred million. Um, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, pretty pretty interesting. We'll yeah, it, it, it was. Uh, it, you know, I look, again, I look forward that, to seeing the product. Yeah, you know, again. You know, it was a good run, and like you're saying, too, you're looking forward to what's going to happen and what kind of product is going to come out. And I think everybody's trying to wonder yeah. and guessing what's going to happen to the product uh, in the future also. So uh, it's pretty interesting, pretty interesting to see. Um, yeah. Just as an aside, just as an aside, um, Grid Angry's latest issues on press will be out and hopefully be in the mail by the end of the week. And I remind everyone, it's our diamond issue, issue number seventy-five. Yeah, it's a very uh, interesting, interesting way, issue. On, uh, sneak, sneak peek of the cover. That looked amazing. Yeah. Uh, who did the uh, Jared did do the artwork on that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It looked incredible. And uh, the hat you, Jared. Brenda had to uh, had to send him uh, some of the very early covers of Gigi, and uh, he put it all together. And, you know, it's, uh, it's a pretty cool cover. It's one of my favorites, to say the least. So that's going to be in the mail soon. And, again, our theme for 2022, if you're not a subscriber to Good Iron Greats Magazine, what are you waiting for? Check out our website for our subscription information, goodirongreatsmagazine.com. All right, our special guest is here, and I'd like to get started with him because we've got a lot of stuff to talk about. Our special guest tonight yep. writes for Windy City Gridiron, and he also co-hosts two <laughs> podcasts on their channel. These podcasts are called Bears Over Beers and Beer <laughs> and Balance. As a content creator, he aims to eliminate aspects of the game to help increase football literacy through thoughtful analysis and visualizing information. I'd like to welcome to our show this evening, Mr. Jeff Burkus. Jeff! Welcome to the show. Hey, guys. Thank you so much for having me. Looking forward to this conversation. Thanks for being on. And I'm going to lead off and ask you if you could tell our audience, how would you get started following the uh, Chicago Bears? Well, that, much like male pattern baldness, was a gift or maybe a curse of my inheritance. So. Um, everyone in my family cheered for the Bears. There's some Chicago connections. I grew up in Iowa, but uh, there's some Chicago connections in my family, uh, going back to grandparents. And uh, I would say that my mom is the biggest Bears fan I've ever met, and so it's a nice little way to 
have a mother-son relationship around uh, our favorite sports team. I love that. Uh, it, 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 Joe here, it, it, Jeff, thank you for being on the show, man. I've been uh, on your website for like the last 30, 40 minutes just laughing and shaking my and nodding my head, just loving it. <laughs> Very well done website. Thank you. Uh, but, yeah, I agree with you. Uh, you know, I, you know, I'm a Seahawks fan because I was born in Portland, Oregon, and, you know, in Portland, and my parents had season tickets to the Seahawks. So, um, yeah, you, you, you collect uh, program covers from Jerry Keefe. I didn't know who Jerry Keefe was before that question was posed. So I, I spent some time digging around, and uh, what I found is an article that you wrote, you know, for your website called The Brush Strokes of a Genius. Uh, and Jerry Keith, you know, made a lot of the uh, program covers for the Bears, you know, during the 30s and 40s. And I, I learned something new. It was incredible. So, so tell us about how you got down that rabbit hole and how you began collecting those covers. Oh, wow. All right. So I was doing a little, little project on Twitter. So you can find me at Gridironborn on Twitter if, that's, uh, if you're on the Bird app. And I was doing a tweet a day for, you know, this day in Bears history, and I started to try to find uh, images from, from games that I wanted to highlight, you know. So I was highlighting all the way back to 1920, you know, through that, that season. And I kept finding these really interesting, cool covers, uh, program covers. I was like, man, these are really cool. And then I noticed uh, the artist's name on the cover, Gary Keith, and I was like, okay, like four or five of these things are by the same artist. Like, who is this guy? So I started to dig, and I realized there was no information about Jerry Keith out there. And so I just thought, this guy needs to be known. <laughs> and so I just uh, I started digging around. Um, I, I, I checked out his son, I, I, and I talked to him. I, I did some uh, pretty extensive research. So um, what I know about Jerry Keith is that he was classically trained illustrator at the Chicago Art Institute. Uh, he studied cartooning under a couple of uh, uh, Pulitzer cartoonists. He had a syndicated comic strip called The OKs uh, that ran throughout the country. Uh, so, so he's in Chicago. He's, he's an artist. And somewhere along the way, he meets George Alice. They become friends and business partners. Yeah. And to the point where they are so close that he asks Alice to be the godfather for his son, the guy that I ended up talking to. And so at one point uh, around the start of the war, uh, Keith gets asked to draw a couple of the program cuts. And so starting in 1943, you will find at least one, if not two or three, Gary Keith program covers amongst the programs through that time period up until 1961. In 1962, hmm. the Bears outsource all of their programs to that generic program cover that, you know, that, that kind of took over in the 60s. But between 43 and 61, these designs, it's, it's 35 unique images. They're used on a total of 38 games. So there's 38 programs that have a Jerry Keith cover on them. Uh, they repurpose three of those images, you know, just changing the background color. And the Bears, what's interesting today is once you get into this and dig in and, and try to find all the programs like I did, you start to see their, these Jerry Keith original images pop up throughout yeah. the decades of Chicago Bears, even to the point where just in 2020, there was a like Soldier Field 5K run that I signed up for because I wanted the shirt that was a repurposed Jerry Keith drawn bear uh, that, that, that they put on the T-shirt and the medal. Uh, and so, so, uh, so I did that. Um, so, again, 38, 38 programs. I have 36 of them in my personal collection. Uh, most of them are in pretty good shape. I'm missing the 43 championship game against Washington and the 45 game against the Rams, which um, that one's really hard to find. And if anybody listening has, have it, has it and wants to sell it, <laughs> you know, find me. Hey, you're talking to the right crowd. So how how'd you do on the 5K? Oh, um, yeah, I, I try to run a half marathon in every state. So uh, it was a virtual oh. 5K because it was in the uh, COVID. Um, but, uh, yeah, oh, I, just, I grabbed the grabbed the shirt and ran around my neighborhood. Oh, never mind. 
I thought it was like me, a 40 minutes 5K. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Unbelievable. Yeah. I wow. I was aware of, I, I've been always aware, and I've always been in awe of the great illustrated covers that I saw, 1950s, 1960s, the old AFL early covers uh, that had the Ooh. illustrations, the cartoons, so on and so forth, and Keith's were right up there also. So um, it, it, it's just truly an, an amazing piece of artwork that is very much lost in today's programs. I mean, today's programs are very bland. They're very, you know, regimentated. They're very, yeah. um, you know, they're, they're blah, to say the least. But um, his, his programs are just, just amazing. And reading your article that you wrote on him, I was like, wow. Uh, what a, what an incredible um, artist this man was, Jeff. What are the top six programs in your collection that were drawn by uh, Keith, and if you could describe them to our audience? Yeah, absolutely. I will say that if I could track down that forty five against the Rams, it would be in my top six um, because that that one's really cool. He's got a bear drawn with the number seven jersey, which was. It was George Callis' jersey when he played, but at the time, it's actually an Ed Sprinkle jersey. Uh, Ed Sprinkle oh, yeah. is getting into the Hall of Fame. And so that's a really cool one. He's, uh, he's sacking a Ram. So that, that would be on the list, but the, of the, what, the ones that I have, uh, there's, a, there's a five program series against the Packers, starts in 1943, goes through 1949. Um, you know, a couple, couple years missing in there. Um, I have all five. They're in great condition. But the crown jewel of that one is the 47, and that's uh, mm-hmm. features this buck tooth bear. He's striking a Heisman pose. It's against a really bright orange background, um, and that's the one that got gets repurposed a lot. Uh, it, it was on that T-shirt. That one's that one's a real crown jewel for me. Uh, the next one I'd highlight is the 1945 program against the Lions. Um, it's got a bear wearing George Wilson's number 30. And he's jumping up and catching a ball over a lion who's trying to swat at the ball. Um, that one's that one's pretty great. It's got a nice blue background. They, he used a, a similar concept uh, about a dozen years later. So in 1957, again against the lions, there's a there's an illustrated bear and an illustrated lion going after a giant orange football. And you know the, the imagery basically shows that the, the bear is going to catch it, the lion's not. Uh, and the bear is wearing number 87, and at the time that was the great Harlan Hills number. He was a personal favorite of mine um, in digging through Bears history. And so that one's that one's a beautiful program. That's one of my favorites. That's framed and up behind me on the wall. Um, so that's that's three. And then I want to highlight sort of the end of Keith's career. Uh, he definitely went out on top uh, in 1960 and 1961 of the four programs that he uh, that he illustrated. Three of them are just awesome. They're really fun. It's kind of a, a dastardly bear. He's just kind of up to hijinks, and he's facing off against rival mascots. And so uh, one of them has a bear uh, hiding a football behind his back, and he's facing down a cowboy, and that was for the Cowboys' inaugural season. So that one's a little bit more expensive to try to get your hands on because there's a lot of Cowboys collectors out there that are fighting you for that one. Uh, there's another yeah. one uh, that has the bear that's up on a cliff, and he is firing a cannon at a Viking ship. And that was the and that's 1961, and that's the Vikings inaugural season. So again, also you're fighting Vikings collectors, and it's a really cool and it's just a lot of fun. Uh, so those those yeah. are a little harder to find. And then the last one I'll highlight um, is, is a personal favorite. I think it's probably the just the funniest image that he came up with, and it shows uh, the middle of the program has a fire, and the bear is is heating a brand of uh, a big letter B over the fire, and that was a, a theme that he would have throughout would be this B, and so he, he's he's heating this brand up, and then behind him there is a, a colt, a Baltimore colt, that is poking his head up behind him with kind of a goofy smile. So this dastardly bear is getting ready to put the brand on the, on the colt, and I just find that to be uh, very fun. Those those three go really well together. Those three are also framed and up on my wall, so I can just turn around uh, at my desk from home at any time and and see most of those programs that I just described to you. 
That's awesome. And you wow. you have pictures of all of those programs in your uh, you know in your uh, artwork of a genius article you wrote. So I'm looking at those as you're describing them. They're really cool. <laughs> like Bob said, they're you almost can break these programs down into. I mean, like in the 20s and 30s, it was a picture of a player on the front, and usually the star player. I mean, whether that was Red Grange or Nagurski or, you know, whomever, it was the star player on the front, just a single image. And then it, it turned into more illustrations here, you know, with the AFC and, you know, in the, you know, the 30s, 40s, 50s. And then you start getting boring stuff in the 70s where it was the same program printed every game in the NFL with just an insert for the lineup. Because, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of interesting. I love seeing the old artwork like this. This is great. Well, I'll give you guys so, a little additional color that I think that we can fit in here. Uh, in, in 1939, there, the, the, the guy that ran the, uh, the art program for these programs, his name was Lou Merrill, and his son, Stu Merrill, had uh, illustrated all the program colors and the uh, covers, and they were individual players of the, of the time. And so if you see the 1939 Bears program, they're, they're illustrated, and they're put to just one player. And in that next offseason, Stu Merrill actually tragically died. He fell down an elevator shaft oh. uh, and, just, and, and just fell to his death. And so oh, in 1940, 40 through 42, uh, the Bears used, like, pictures that were cut out and put on the front of the program with, like, these bright backgrounds. So there's, uh, it's interesting to see program covers from 39 and then to 40, 41, 42 that are pretty different, and then 43 starts the Keith era, and then mixed in are kind of those generic program covers as well. Interesting. Wow. wow. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. You, that, yeah. I'll tell you, in one of your blog – oh, sorry, Bob. I was just going to say – one of your blog you, know, you looked, mentioned – Go ahead, Bob. Your show, bud. No, I was, I was just going to say, I um, I always said, like I said before, 50s and 60s, up to roughly 67, 68, great illustrations on, on um, the program, so on and so forth. And it carried over through a lot of college programs, had very similar types of programs, too, with the great illustrations, the great artwork on them at the same time. I mean, to me, it's the, it's the glory era of football programs, and you could basically, totally. I have always used 1946 right after World War II, right up to roughly 1967, 68, where everything just kind of phased out and everything went back to very standardized programs, with the exception of some colleges that still had some great yeah. illustrations in, in the late 60s and the 70s. But uh, you yeah. described what you showed in your article. Uh, it, Jeff, it's just incredible to see. I mean, it's just so, so beautiful to see those those programs all at once. Amazing, truly amazing. Yeah. And Jeff, I it, you know I didn't you know give you our bio, but I mean I I collect you know Red Grange and Chicago Bear, you know you know early you know twenties and thirties stuff, mostly during the Grange era. And I'm, I'm working on a run of ticket stubs and programs for every game Red Grange played in. Uh, I call it my monster. So I've got, you know, uh, you know, a hundred programs from his games going back to his college games and, you know, you know, all the way up and through professional, you know, including his last game in 1935. So, uh, yeah, I, I love looking at programs and their illustrations and thumbing through them. I mean, so, yeah, it's, it's cool to see these. And you know, as a juxtaposition, it's it's kind of cool. Uh, do you, do you collect anything else? You mentioned bobbleheads in one of your articles. <laughs> uh, the Bears put out for their hundredth year. They gave a bobblehead out to in, in every game. And I thought I thought they were really cool. Yeah. So uh, I, I collected those bobbleheads. I have an, an additional Red Grange bobblehead from the Wrigley Field bobblehead uh, yeah. in the way as well. Um, I, I don't have an expensive collection beyond that. I've got some cars. Uh, actually, like you guys were talking about tops at the beginning of the show, and I actually stopped collecting when tops lost the ability to, to issue football cars. Um, so I have yeah. a lot of like tops museum stuff and things like that. Mm. I think I have that same Grange bobblehead sitting on my desk. It, it, yeah. People are constantly like, why the hell do you have a player from the 20s and 30s? <laughs> Anyways, it's, it's, a, it's a tough story, but you, 
you've been doing this a long time. I, you know, you have a, a really good, you know, website, a blog. I mean, I, I, I dig this. You're, you're my new best friend. Uh, I mean, do you have any interesting <laughs> collecting stories you want to share? I think from the programs, uh, I've, I've, I've encountered a lot of interesting characters. Uh, basically, any time that I would see a program that would be a Jerry Keith cover say on eBay or anywhere else or I'd go, to a, go to a show, I, I would reach out to the person and I would say, hey, I got a list. I'm looking for these. Uh, you know, do you have any or do you know where I can get them? Um, that's how I was able to build out, you know, up to 36 of those 38 programs. And so I, I was able to talk to a few interesting characters, guys that have been around the Chicago collecting scene a long time and had, you know, directly collected, you know, some game used uniforms like from the 60s and 70s and like some crazy stories there. But I think probably the coolest part of the of the Gary Keith cover selection is that I did acquire a couple of the programs from the personal collection of Doug Atkins, who's the Bears Hall of Fame. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Um, and so, you know, they cut, they, they're, that's just a nice little piece. Uh, so they were in his personal collection. He played in that game. Uh, and now I have a, those programs that are part of that uh, piece cover collection. That's really cool. Did that come from his family, or was that, you know, who was yeah, so that, that uh, Mr. Atkins died, you know, a few years ago, and his son cleaning out some of his stuff and, and sold them through a collector. You know, I, I spoke with the, the – or sold them through, a, you know, a, a seller. And so I I, I spoke with him and, and uh, was able to acquire the, the two key covers uh, in, in that transaction. And, uh, oh, wow. Little, you know, certificates. So, yeah, it's nice. That's really cool. <laughs> I, I love that kind of providence. That's the best kind to get, especially from a player's family or the player himself, so on and so forth. Uh, you can never go wrong with that. And, and, and to, I think a lot of players appreciate collectors still collecting their stuff, and if they can hand it down to a collector, knowing that it's you know going to be going to be taken care of and preserved, it's it's a it's a good thing. It's a good thing for the hobby, to say the least. For sure. Can you tell our audience about your uh, two podcasts? Uh, bears over beers and beer, a uh, bear and balance. I guess that bear and balance. Yeah. Uh, no, no. Well, there's there's a lot of words that are similar there. So the so bears over beers is actually kind of what it sounds like. We just wrapped up season three, so we've been doing that for a while. My co-host and I. Basically, the shtick is that we bring on a craft beer. Sometimes we need something a little bit uh, harder than the craft beer, so I'll bring on bourbon from time to time. Particularly watching this this team. And then we just chat about the Bears. I mean, that, that's, that's the idea. Um, this year we transitioned it into – this season, I should say, we transitioned it into a, uh, a preview show. Um, we, we avoid the hot takes. We're able to get on some pretty good guests. We've had, we had a lot of national writers on. Um, you know, we had Robert Mays from The Athletic on uh, about this time last year, and we've been able to have a lot of other national writers on to, to talk about their – the team that they cover, and so we've got a lot of really great firsthand information there. Fair and Balanced, I co-host with our editor at Windy City Gridiron, Lester and Wilt Fonk, Jr., and that's a, a balanced take on what we just watched. We re- record the show about 24 hours after the, after the game is over, so hopefully all of the emotion and venom that we have from, from a tough Bears loss or you know, come down from the high of a Bears win so that you're not uh, you know, too, too high on the team. Um, and we, we go through categories. We always start off with a trench tribute. I played in the offensive line. My co-host was an offensive lineman. So we always uh, highlight the big guys first, and then we, we get into what we saw in the game and, and try to break it down in a balanced perspective. Uh, so, so those are those two, two podcasts. I, I did run a, a history series. I did that during the first pandemic summer. Uh, seems like a really long time ago, but it wasn't that long ago, uh, where I – I did. I called it Hallis to Mac, and Chicago Bears history by the decade. And so each episode uh, covered one decade of Chicago Bears football, starting in the 1920s, and obviously moving all the way up until uh, the present day. And then we did a futures episode. So uh, that was that was a really fun project. I'm always looking to highlight the history, weave it in, try to give it context so that we don't forget some of the great names and performances of the past. Right on. That's great. I got a, I got a 
quick question for you. What do you think of the uh, firing of your coach and where do you think they're going to go with a new coach for the team? Your opinion. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, we, we came Matt out Nagy. last year. Yeah, yeah, we came out last year and thought that uh, the right move was to clean house last year. And we were maybe not surprised that George McCaskey right. didn't do that last year, but he should have. And this year was pretty predictable in what happened uh, because of it. So I, I feel like it was overdue. Um, I'm glad that, that it did happen. Where they're going to go, I'm not sure. Uh, there's, there's a lot of very interesting names that are being circulated right now for the general manager name. Um, they've put in requests for a lot of interesting head coaching names. I'm not going to get stuck on one. I, I really like Brian Dayball out in Buffalo. I, I think that he runs a very interesting offense. He has a diverse background. I think he'd be really fun with Justin Fields. But I'm not locked into just one coach right now. I just hope that whoever it is has a really good plan to, to develop and make Justin Fields into what I think he can be. Good. I noticed one of your uh... – on your rolling scrolling names on your uh, on, on I think your website was Dan Quinn who used to be the defensive coordinator for uh, the Seahawks who went on to the Atlanta Falcons. I mean he'd be you know very defensive minded coach. I always always heard twenty years ago that Chicago Bears were a running back and a linebacker. Everything else was ancillary, and that that, that always stuck with me. And Dan Quinn obviously very you know defensive minded. Yeah, I would like it if it's not Dan Quinn. I do think he's got a chance to go to Denver if he's going anywhere. Uh, I think that if it is Dan Quinn, then he needs to have a plan for Justin Fields. I think that's the number one thing for me. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Um, tell tell our listeners about the, the Windy City Gridiron articles you write for them. I mean, you're, you know, I'm, like I, like I mentioned, I've been on your, your, your site for about, you know, for about, you know, I checked it out after, you know, Captain introduced us, and then you know before the show, just to refresh my memory. It's it's really fun. Yeah, so Windy City Gridiron is the uh, SB Nation Bears site. Uh, so SB Nation has a fan site for every NFL team and, and all the other sports as well. Um, I've been writing there for I think seven years now, seven and a half years. Uh, right now, I'm responsible for a column called Ten Thoughts on the NFL, where I try to canvas the whole league try to give my thoughts. You know, on a weekly basis of what's going on around the entire NFL. So it's not just Bears centric. I, I have to. I, I do follow the entire league, so it's, it's nice to not only write about the Bears. I also write a column called Visualize This, and as using my statistics background and, and my visualization background to try to explain topics that maybe most fans aren't thinking about or don't understand, and try to present it in a visually interesting a different way so that I can try to help advance that football literacy a little bit or just kind of bring up something that's interesting that people may not have considered before in a different way. And so that's what that article has been about. Uh, and then, yeah. of course, a few podcasts, you know, get, get conversation going there. Uh, in the off season, I usually participate in or lead the development of some kind of historical deep dive type project. Uh, the last few years, I've done things like a. Uh, I did the Keith. The Keith article came out last year. That was my big deep dive. Uh, year before, I came out with a article series called the uh, the Championship Belt Series, which was identifying the best player on the team um, at in any given year, starting in 1920 and traveling all the way through the history of the Bears. Uh, for that article series, I we we created a poster for each series for like the two top competitors, uh, kind of like a fight poster, an old boxing poster, something like that. You know, so there's a there's an old George Trafton poster that uh, you guys might enjoy since you like Brett Grange as well. Um, and then for each guy that won the had the belt at some point, I I, I gave him walk up music, uh, like he was entering the ring to, to some to some song. Uh, you know, just having some fun with it. Did a lot of stuff like that and. You know, kind of just a fun story. Dick Buckus, of all people, just got on Twitter. Um, he's just he's just ramping up his Twitter account. And I tweeted at it today, and I was like, oh, well, here's the poster from the championship belt series that I did uh, that features you and, and Gail Sayers. And he's like, love this, right? So um, every once in a while you can kind of connect to the people that you're writing about, uh, and, th- and that's pretty cool, too. So I, so I do the history uh, stuff of – 
there's another guy on the site that does a lot of uh, history uh, things as well. A couple guys actually really into history. And then this, this off season, I'm actually going to dive into a book idea that I have, um, which is on the 1940s uh, dynasty fairs. Nice. Very cool. It's nice to see the old timers get on Twitter and especially to be active and share stories. Uh, you know, it, it, especially Dick Butkus. Think about, I mean, you know, he is the Bears. You talk about a running back and a linebacker, that starts with Dick, Dick Butkus. I, I mean, absolutely, right? I mean, Walter Payton, Dick Butkus, Gail Sayers, right? Now you, you just named the top three players in Bears history. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and you're, you're, you're leaving off, I mean, Bronco Nagurski, Red I mean, you've got a lot of leaving off. I mean, even modern day, Erlocker, you know, Mike Singletary. I mean, I, I, I can't name George. another team that is more steeped in, in Hall of Fame history. The Bears, I mean, the Packers would be there. I mean, it's Bears and Packers, just the one-two punch to me, you know. I don't know. Yeah, for linebackers and running backs, it's, it's not really close, right? The Bears sort of dominate that category. Oh, with, um, without a doubt. Yeah, without a doubt. Um. I was gonna, there's an old Dick Butkus story I remember hearing where, like, his last game of his career and the coach is like, you know, hey, last game we're winning, anything you want to do? And he's like, yeah, I want to kick an extra point. And, uh, you know, and the coach is like, extra point? He's like, yeah, for some reason I've been working on this. And I, I, the, the, he, he told, uh, you know, this is a story that's been told over and over. And, I, and Joe Theismann was on their, his team for some reason. Like, I didn't know Joe Theismann was on his team. He must have come out of the CFL or something and done it. And, Theismann was the holder, as backup quarterbacks were many times. And uh, Butkus comes trotting out to the to the uh, huddle. Theismann's like, what are you doing out here, man? We'll kick an extra point. And Butkus looks at him and he goes, I'm here to kick the extra point. You better hold the ball, rookie, or, or I'll kick your damn head through the upright. <laughs> and <laughs> Theismann's like, okay. And apparently the extra point went through. It wasn't pretty, but it went through. And that's just – I think that's more lore than anything, but even if it's not true, I love that damn story. You better hold the ball, rookie, or I'll kick your head through the uprights. <laughs> well, I'm not familiar with that one, but I there are some fun clips of him I, that he would have gotten called for taunting in today's, you know, rules. But oh. he there's a couple of, like, bad snaps, and Bobby Douglas does the scramble drill and, and, and throws him the ball on, on an extra point. So he's blocking for an extra point. And, and so he, he actually catches two extra points um, on the on the scramble drill from bad snap. Oh. And on one of on one of them he holds he catches the ball and then holds out the ball to the defender uh, as kind of a you know like here you go <laughs> kind of a taunt and the defender like you know slaps it away uh, and just the, the the stories that you'd like him to tell of like what were you thinking or you know what did this guy say to you or you know what did you say here to get that reaction. Uh, because he was obviously quite the character. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> yeah, I would say he That's began true. that, you know, that 50s, you know, yeah, that, that 50s, 60s uh, Bears era. Yeah, I hear you. It was interesting, Jeff, when you're saying you, you covered the entire NFL. I just recently moved down to uh, North Carolina here. So, my NFL football uh, is radically different than the uh, Northeast where I came from, out of Connecticut, where I traditionally just saw Jets, Giants, and Patriots every week. Uh, so I've, I've seen basically Tampa, New Orleans, Atlanta, Tennessee, Carolina, uh, the uh, Washington uh, team. It's just been amazing to see all these teams that I really haven't seen a lot for the entire season with uh, just the spattering of the other three teams. So it's pretty interesting. I got a, I got a definitely a different perspective this year as far as uh, watching football, seeing these other teams in action, and actually seeing a game that they played in. So it was pretty interesting to me uh, to see it. Um, I'm still not a fan of any local team here, however, but uh, I still, uh, enjoyed, 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 still enjoyed watching them, to say the least. And then the second thing I was going to talk about uh, real quick, um, a lot of people say, uh, if you see some of my pictures and compare them to Ditka, 
um, especially with the mustache. Uh, we, we look like <laughs> brothers to a certain, certain degree. So it was pretty pretty interesting. And my brother-in-law uh, <laughs> met uh, Ditka at a uh, Walter Camp dinner in New Haven, Connecticut. And he got a good picture of uh, him, and he showed a picture of me to Ditka. And uh, Ditka laughed, and he says, uh, he must be a cousin of mine. I, 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 it's pretty <laughs> Looks pretty. Well, pretty. pretty uh, we're pretty sure Bob pretty, was born. Uh, family like that. I was. I was. I've only had it for uh, well, fifty some odd years now. So, uh, but it was yeah. interesting. But again, the perspective on the NFL with all the other teams was interesting to me. And it was definitely interesting. Regular game of the week. I always, I, for many games down here, I saw the second game. So it'd be the New Orleans, Atlanta, Tampa. Uh, or Tennessee or um, Carolina, so uh, it's pretty pretty interesting perspective to say the least. But um, that, that it is uh, location wise is everything when it comes to the NFL, and or get the NFL Network one or the other. <laughs> That's what it comes <laughs> down to. I normally Jeff, I normally ask this question uh, at the end of our our uh, series of questions and uh, not to put you on the spot, but I'm going to ask you uh, and your thoughts on this. Do you have any advice for somebody who's a beginning collector in a hobby? Can you give them any guidance? What are your thoughts on it? Any? Yeah, I think, you know, for me, I've, I've started a number of collections over the years and sometimes it's just little small things. And sometimes you get into it and you realize like, man, there is so much stuff out there. And, yeah. you know, most people have limited resources. Uh, I think that's probably fair to say. You only have so much disposable income. And, and so I think that you can't have everything. And so I, I've met a lot of people that try to get everything or they, you know, they, they don't even really like the stuff they have. They just they, they think it's going to be valuable or something like that. Maybe it will be. Um, but I, I think that picking the stuff that you really like and sort of focusing your resources there, you're going to be a lot happier with your collection. I would much rather have a small collection of really amazing stuff that I really liked than a really big collection of stuff that I'm kind of okay with. That's a really good point. You're right. It's very good advice for the the collectors. Yeah, collect what you like and, yeah, do it. So at thinking about bears, I mean, you know, it's, it, it seems like we could sit around and have a beer or a bourbon, depending on how, how the conversation goes, who you guys get as a coach, and just talk football. I've, I've really enjoyed uh, it. It's just, I don't know. I always just kind of, I mean, I, you know, I've always migrated towards the bears. I just love them. A couple, couple quick, you know, just kind of litmus tests here. Uh, who do you think was cooler? 1985 Jim McMahon or 1988 Brian Bosworth? <laughs> well, boy, um, I mean, I'm contractually obligated to, to say McMahon, but, you know, Mc, McMahon was his own kind of cool, right? Like he was yeah. like this, this, this dude that just didn't care. Maybe Bosworth didn't care. It felt like Bosworth was a little bit more of an act, whereas – you know, do you know the story about Jim McMahon's first interaction at Hallis Hall at or the meeting George Hallis? No. He he shows up to camp right after he's dra- or he shows up after he's drafted, and they they have him uh, meet George Hallis. But George Hallis makes him wait, and he's probably taking a nap. You know, he's an old man at that point. And and Jim McMahon shows up drinking a beer. But he just has a beer with him, so he's, that's how he shows up uh, to, to meet George Hallis. And then George Hallis comes in and tells him that of all the things that he doesn't like about him and all the things that he doesn't like about his game, and he's like, what the hell? Who's <laughs> this guy? And that's like how he started his Bears career was George Hallis kind of dressing him down about the things he didn't like. And Dick's like, from that wow. moment, he's like, all right, whatever, man. Like, I don't really care. Like, he never – he didn't say, oh, I'm going to try to get in line and – Impress this yeah. founding father of the NFL. He's like, whatever. If you don't like me, then just get rid of me. Wow. <laughs> and there he went. Because what did he get drafted in? What was it? Eighty-two. Eighty-three. Uh, top my top my head. That sounds right. Yeah. 
Yeah, so well, yeah, I think we're going to put Yeah. And the answer to that is Jim McMahon is cooler than Brian Bosworth because you want to know what's really cool? Super Bowl rings. <laughs> Brian Bosworth yeah, doesn't cool. have one. <laughs> All right. The other Next cool thing is question. that uh, Mick, well, Mick, I'll just say real quick, McMahon showed up to the White House after the Packers won the Super Bowl in his Bears jersey. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> I forgot about that. <laughs> yeah, I heard that. I that's that. right. <laughs> I'm sure that I've, 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 I've had a few people. A uh, yeah, there's a bit there. of a rivalry there. Uh, all right, another topic, which defense was better, the 2014 Seahawks Legion of Boom or the 85 Bears? <laughs> so um, statistically, the 86 Bears are actually better than the 85 Bears. Oh, really? So there is that. Interesting. Um, so, so you can kind of dig into that. Obviously, they're a little different because the front yeah. seven for the 85, 86 Bears, 84, 85, 86 Bears, really, um, was dominant. You want to look at, like, their sack records. And basically, Buddy Ryan's just bringing, like, you know, he's just zero coverage and bringing blitz all the time, and no one had ever really oh, yeah. done that before. So he was he was aggressive. Yeah, Whereas yourself. the Legion of Boom, you know, cover three with, you know, the back end being these players, and, you know, Sherman's going to be in the Hall of Fame. And, uh, you know, yeah, you've got Thomas yeah. and – Chancellor uh, are really good players, right? So, so those, uh, you know, they're they're very different. Uh, and again, I'm contractually obligated to say the '85 Bears. Yeah, no, they, they are different. A number of games played, and you're right. I mean, you know, just that Buddy Ryan blitz, you know, is challenging a quarterback to do his job, to just you know pick up the you know pick up the downfield receiver. And yeah, no, you're that's a very good point. I like that. It is subjective. And, you know, in order to be the Legion of Boom, you have to have that lockdown corner, that Cam Chancellor, you know. I mean, it was just, it was, yeah, it was a, it was a good time in the NFL. But I thought points-wise, I mean, like, how would you rate a defense? Yards allowed, points? I mean, that's that's interesting. I didn't realize that about the 86 Bears even. That's that's fascinating. Hmm. All right. Well, that's, all, that's it. I'm out of tricks, man. <laughs> Thanks, guys. I really appreciate the time. I appreciate the conversation. Yeah. Jeff, thanks for being on. Jeff, thank you very much. Thanks, guys. All right. We're down to a few more minutes, and we're going to go into our two-minute warning. Joe, I'm going to hand off to you. And what did you pick up on tonight's show? Man, I, I, would, I would love to have a bourbon with that guy. It's just I, uh, I, I, I mean, I'm a Seahawks fan, but I obviously have a passion for the Bears, you know, just because of what I collect. I have a, you know, have a tremendous amount of respect. I mean, the Packers are steeped in NFL history. So I probably just named my three favorite teams, you know, Seahawks, Bears, Packers in that order. Uh, but it's very mm-hmm. tight, you know. And uh, any chance you can get to talk to somebody who, you know, is as – in you know, entrenched in the bears like Jeff is. It's just, it's fun. It's fascinating. Uh, and again, that's why we have, you know, you know, I have the best seat in the house. Is I get a, you know, I get to do that. I, I, I love it. I, you know, great guest, Bob. How, how did you, how, how do you know him? How'd you invite him? Uh, I got his article from Windy City, believe it or not, from Josh Adams and John Spano. And um, they sent it to me and I, we, Jeff and I have been emailing back and forth working on a time to come on and uh fortunately this Ooh. time worked out and uh i, I knew it would, it would be a incredibly interesting show and again anybody who knows me knows one of my my great loves of great love of football member but your programs and uh to see those programs i mean they're just incredible oh yeah incredible pieces of history as far as i'm concerned i just love that stuff so much uh, it's not even funny. And, uh, you know, again, I only have a handful, and I do believe I do have one key program from the 50s. And uh, fortunately, we're going to be moving in by the end of the month, so I'll be getting my collection back <laughs> again, and I can start going, going through everything again and start pulling out stuff and, and seeing it. But, uh, man, that what a what a great collection of programs. I just love it. I love it. And I love the story behind it, too, at the same time. That's what, that's what makes the hobby fun. I mean, yeah, you know, I was just going to say, isn't you know, it fascinating? Uh, 
how it's fascinating it's, how it's people find amazing. themselves collecting certain things. Right. You know. Right. It's just it's just truly amazing to to hear the stories of uh, family members or whoever, sons, daughters, uh, nieces, nephews, whoever, handing down the stuff to collectors and or people who uh, are very knowledgeable about the uh, about the. Uh, just, a, just really amazing. Yeah. Uh, well, it it makes me realize. Oops, so it makes me realize I don't pay attention to a lot of stuff. I've never heard of, you know, you know, Keith before that. And so it's kind of cool, and it's mostly because I, I focus on, you know, older programs. So it's really cool to see some right. of the artwork. Right. The art, the art again. The artwork, fifties and sixties. Some of the artists there were just were just truly magnificent in their work. Keith being right up there with with many others. All right, we got less than a minute. Uh, again, if you're not a subscriber to Good Iron Grace Magazine, what are you waiting for? Check out our website, goodirongracemagazine.com. All right, Joe, 10-second wrap-up. Any other final thoughts? Uh, great show, great guest. Thank you, Captain. We'll be back hopefully next week with another show. Until then, thanks for listening. Goodirongracemagazine.com. Hey there, sports history fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the Football History Dude, and I wanted to thank you for stopping by to listen to another episode here on the Sports History Network. Our podcasters are passionate about uncovering and sharing sports stories from yesteryear. And if you didn't know it already, we have over 30 shows across the network covering all sorts of sports history topics. In fact, here's a glimpse into one of our awesome podcasts here on the network. Each week, the official Football Learning Academy podcast will take you deep into the history of pro football through interviews with players, coaches, or administrators in the NFL, as well as interviews with Pro Football Hall of Fame selectors, authors, and historians. You'll learn how the game evolved and important moments that shaped the sport into what it is today. And don't miss the Pro Football History Nugget of the Week. Listen to the official Football Learning Academy podcast on the Sports History Network. How about that? I bet you're super hyped to go listen to that new podcast, right? Well, to learn about this show and all the other podcasts on the network, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash podcast. Again, that's sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash podcast. Head over there today to find your next favorite sports history podcast.